Welcome. Sorry about the um, technical issues. This is our first um, RM Partners Future Focus webinar program. Um, this is a monthly program of webinars um, for uh, cancer CNSs and AMPs funded by uh, RM Partners. Um, so I'm chairing uh, the first meeting, which is why you've seen my slightly smiling face for the last five minutes. Um, I'm Philip Hand. I'm um, the senior nurse for cancer services here at London Northwest University Hospital. Um, Elaine Tomlins, um, you've seen in the chat, um, she's a nurse consultant for chemotherapy from um, the Royal Marsden, and she'll be facilitating um, this webinar as well. So looking at the comments and bringing questions across for the Q and A session. So our first webinar is presented by Susan Sinclair, who's the managing director of RM Partners. Um, Susan is an experienced um, healthcare leader with extensive experience in turnaround and transformation in a variety of settings. She's got significant experience of forming partnerships with clinical leaders to successfully deliver ambitious aims and objectives. And um, Susan also has a deep understanding of the wider NHS, academic and social care needs in the current climate. So the presentation today within the webinar is our strategy and the power of the cancer workforce. This will be followed by a Q&A session. So if you do, if you have any questions that come you know, through the presentation, please do put them on the um, comment section of my chat, um, and they'll be pulled across to um, enter the Q&A session, which will be done after the presentation is completed. Um, and also, as part of that Q&A session, obviously have the opportunity to ask questions as well. The meeting will be recorded, just so everyone's aware, so it can be available for people to watch if they haven't been able to attend today. Uh, but if you could all remember to be on mute until you do ask any questions. Thank you very much and welcome. Hi everyone. Um, slightly bizarrely, I can't see any of you at all. Um, and I've been sitting in the green room waiting to be let in. So I'm going to start by um, presenting and then we'll um, have questions afterwards. Before I get up my presentation, I wanted to say um, a huge thank you for everyone for attending today and also what an absolute privilege it is to be um, the inaugural speaker for the Future Forum for our own partners. Um, my background, as I'm sure Philippa mentioned, is um, nursing and bone marrow transplantation and so to be in the role of a managing director of our own partners with the um, ability to support the transformation of care for over 4 million residents of North and South West London is a huge honour. Um, the last thank you I'd like to say is to the, our steering group that actually brought this into being in what I think we can all agree is a pretty challenging year. So thank you to Elaine, McKay, Laura, Louise, Philippa and Nate for, for bringing this um, and bringing us all together today. And I'm now just going to bring up my presentation. Okay, everyone. So um, I'm hoping you can see that all okay. Um, and before we start on the Alliance Overview and Strategy, I just wanted to remind us of a couple of things to celebrate that have happened really in my nursing lifetime. Um, in 1990, which was um, actually well, well before I started uh, nursing, but not that far off, um, I was definitely planning to be a nurse by then. And five year survival for cancer was just 41% in um, England. It's now over 50%. And the nurse consultant role had not even been invented. So we had increasing numbers of CNSs, but the real advanced practice and nurse prescribers weren't even in the system. And I think at the moment, it's very hard to remember where we've come because we've had this terrible hiatus of, of transformation really because of COVID. But I think that the, the work that we're seeking to do as a Cancer Alliance is really on building on those successes and hopefully accelerating some of them. So for those of you that don't know, RMP is the Cancer Alliance that spans about half of London. We cover North and South West London and all of the um, providers within that. So what that means is that we have three big um, tertiary cancer centres um, and seven DGHs. And one of the things that gives us is a real understanding of both um, the, the needs of a DGH who ultimately will be supporting and um, diagnosing most patients with cancer and then how we really exponentially improve care through the support of our tertiary advisors as well. And we also have ICR, Imperial and George's Medical School, so huge amounts of intellectual clout behind the Alliance. The role of Alliances um, came out of the long-term plan, 
And what it set was some very ambitious targets, which were to diagnose 75% of patients at stage one and two. And if I remind you, in 2010, we were at 50%. So this is an exponential increase to where we are now. And because early diagnosis is the biggest win for improving survival, they then were able to calculate that if we did that, 55,000 more people would survive for five years or more. And with all of that, the expectation and need to deliver it actually is to reduce health inequalities. Now, for us as an um, a organisation, that's obviously changed somewhat in the three years because since um, the long-term plan um, came about, we've had the COVID um, pandemic, which we'll come on to, but also the, the real role of ICSs. And I, I, one of the things that um, we decided was it'd be useful for me to just spend a couple of minutes talking about this, but I think that the way that um, the oversight of care is um, being managed in England is changing significantly through ICSs, which pre-COVID were very nascent and, and, and not quite in um, full uh, sort of statutory um, alignment. Now that they're, they're actually the white paper is going through to actually give them statutory authorities, which means they're a legal being with legal rights. And what that means for us is that instead of dealing with 14 different commissioners as well as our 10 different providers, we now have got um, two big ICSs covering about 2 million patients each, North West London slightly bigger. And within that, that means that we, we've got a real opportunity to work with our ICSs to support at scale transformation. But the ICS framework also talks about some really important things that we are reflecting in the way that we work in our strategy. So the first is provider collaboratives. And you may have heard of this concept of the duty to collaborate. So under the old payment system for um, providers, PBR, there was a real incentive to compete with each other. Now that's seen as not helpful to care. And actually it's much more about a statutory obligation for people to work together. And actually, as we start thinking about or continue to think about how we improve the resilience of our COVID recovery and, and our organisations, that piece around collaboration is critical. There's this concept called PLACE, which I'm not sure all of you will have heard of, but what that's really acknowledging is, is that if you work at a population of 2 million patients, especially in London, there's a huge amount of diversity within that. And so what place-based working is trying to reflect, and, and, and these are really boroughs, I think, in terms of sort of the scale, it's about what the local needs are of those um, places. And so certainly for cancer, we see places having a really important role in terms of local prevention that is based on the population. We know in London, there's huge differences in smoking um, uptake, and that obviously means different place-based um, priorities in terms of pro um, prevention. But we also know that things like screening uptake are really, really place-based in terms of how we can work with local populations to encourage them to come forward. And then when we think about referral, place is really important in terms of ensuring that the primary care and place-based organisations such as community trusts are really able to um, access um, cancer care. Um, cancer has been largely commissioned um, by something called specialist commissioning and that too will go back down to ICSs over time and working through what that means is a key priority for ICSs um, over the next few years, as is understanding what our payment system will be. In terms of um, what our clinical challenges are, I think what they come down to ultimately is one word, which is variation. So here I've pulled out the bowel screening um, across our population. It's measured at GP practice level. And what you can see is our best GP practice in the whole of North and South West London has got nearly 80% of eligible patients screened, whereas our worst has got only 31%. And so what that means is that before we try and get a few more people up here, we've got a much bigger health need to remove the inequity from this much lower um, number. Similarly, we talk about 75% of our patients um, being diagnosed at stage one and two. And if we look at breast cancer, the average stage of diagnosis across our um, patch is 83%. But you can see the range is quite big, it's 76 to 89%. Um, and for lower GI, that range goes from 32 to 57. And so really tackling the variation and understand what's going on in those areas to learn and enhance is going to be really important. And the third issue is survival variation. 
And what we know is that for some cancers such as breast, where we have excellent five and 10 year survival expectations, we have tumors such as pancreatic cancer, which has a 3.3% survival and rate at 10 year, uh, five years um, post. And so when we think about these things, we've got to think about the tumor inequities, the, the uptake of things like staging, and also how we change the way that people are coming forward to make sure that everyone gets staged early who is not being screened. We also know that cancer care is changing, and I think we're sort of midway through the genetics revolution. So we've got some of our tumor sites that are very, very genetic um, based, but what we, I think, are going to be moving into much more is using genetics as a way to select high-risk populations and monitor them for, in the same way that, say, for breast at the moment, um, or Lynch syndrome, we've started screening for those patients proactively. I think that's going to be the much more common um, position. We all know that patients are going to know much more about their genetics. And I think for us as um, senior nurses and, and clinicians, really having a working knowledge of genetics is going to become completely essential. We also know that cancer is an older person's disease, and I think that we all already seeing an older, multi-morbid population living with cancer. And for that reason, and understanding how best to manage those patients, we've funded a um, senior oncology service pilot at um, the Marsden to really understand how we can optimise care for this older population. We saw through COVID um, a sort of necessity to drive to telehealth, but I think increased, and, and we've seen over probably the last 30 years, an increase in ambulatory care. But I think this will become more and more normalised. And I think, um, I would say that I'm not sure we all have a love affair with telehealth at the moment, and probably um, the sound not working at the start of the, um, this presentation hasn't helped um, that process. But I think that, um, eventually that's going to become something that patients and staff value. And then, of course, the issue that is um, linked with actually good survival, which is the long term side effects and how we manage those patients in the longer term. And of course, um, we can't do anything these days without mentioning COVID. And I think that you all are living and breathing this in terms of the pressure of long waiters more than we've ever seen, the demands and most of our two week wait pathways are sort of sitting at about 10 percent. Um, over at the moment and, and very, very fluctuating as well, which doesn't help. We have unmet needs, and we know that last year far fewer people came forward um, into the two-week wait and um, cancer screening programmes than normal. And what that meant is this concept of missing first treatments or patients that, that haven't accessed cancer care that we would have expected to, and far greater inequality. So for us as a um, alliance, I think what we have tried to do when we think about our strategy and work plan is really bring together the, the benefits of working together with our ICSs, the national mandate and the real clinical problems um, we face in order to deliver 75% um, of our patients with an early diagnosis, but also really embracing the concept of holistic care and making that feel meaningful and strong. And certainly some of the feedback we had from nurses during the engagement process for our strategy was that holistic care is very, very important, but the um, process doesn't always feel as valuable to nurses as it could do in terms of um, being really meaningful. It can be rushed and it can be um, done quickly because we know we've got to get sort of over the line in terms of the numbers. And I think we know that that's not great for patients, not great for nursing, and actually not the way nurses want to practice. So coming on to our mandate, nationally we've been um, given the mandate to develop the cancer strategy for our ICSs and ensure whole system cancer planning. And what that means is that we need to work through how the system needs to um, deliver and improve cancer care in order to deliver our long-term plan. And obviously, we know that for very few specialties, cancer is a part of an overall specialty. So for GI, there's lots of other things that can be wrong with someone, as well as bowel cancer. And so we need to think about how it works in the round. Um, we also need to lead the delivery of the cancer plan. And so part of our strategy is really being clear about how we expect um, and what we expect to do. And what we've been doing with our pathway groups is working really hard to make sure that we understand what needs to be delivered at each pathway level in order to really improve the care for um, patients with that disease. And so over the last year, we've been integrating very strongly into our ICS governance structures. 
and um, making sure that we're embedded with primary care because it's very difficult for a secondary care organisation to diagnose a patient that isn't in the system and so primary care is critical. Um, and also make sure that we're continuing to engage with our clinicians and managers on the grounds and also through forums like our Lead Nurses Forum. So coming now, now on to our delivery plan, I think the first thing is COVID recovery. And I think we all wish that that was um, easier and quicker to manage than it is. And I think what we're really seeing is that the focus now and actually in the future is really about resilience in workforce, compelling workforce models that attract and retain staff and thinking about um, transformation in terms of um, really minimising the steps patients have to take to find out whether they have a cancer diagnosis. And so, um, and, and I think in terms of some of our work on recovery, in terms of encouraging patients to come back into the system, we feel that that's pretty complete now, even in the second surge patients were still pretty much accessing two week wait with only about 10% drop on, on expected activity. So now I think it's really about how do we really support the treatment teams and the diagnostic teams to ensure that people feel that they're um, you know, recovered in what may be a fairly sustained amount of activity for cancer. So what we know is that in order for people to access a cancer pathway, they're either going to come through a place like a GP appointment or through one of the national screening programmes. And the three that we have at the moment are bowel, breast and cervical. We're doing a huge pilot in RMP around lung cancer screening, um, which is um, in Sutton, Hammersmith and Fulham and Hillingdon, and that's really understanding whether we can um, support early stage diagnosis for patients who are at high risk of lung cancer. And we also are expecting that there'll be emergent screening approaches that we will try and will be adopted nationally for high risk patients. And a really good example of that is Lynch syndrome, which will be a sequin next year, but has been led by the London Northwest and St Mark's team. And what we know um, is for screening, we need to increase uptake, but probably more importantly, reduce variation so that across our population, irrespective of deprivation, ethnicity, um, gender and all of the other protective characteristics, we are able to know that we've got really, really standardised um, access to screening. The place in primary care, we know that we've got to improve the ability for patients to come forward if they've got symptoms, so, so what's called the patient interval. Um, and also make sure that we understand the factors that, that are changing the way different GPs work. So, and that's called the referral interval. So we know that it's probably not right for every referral to be sent after the first GP appointment because there may be investigations or, or you know, cancer is always the least common thing that's going to happen in most specialties. Um, um, but we also, so, so for us, it's really understanding what those pathways look like to make sure that when we look at variation of two week waits and numbers of times a, a patient's access to GP to be um, diagnosed, that, that's a bit more standard. And then a huge amount of work has been going on for the last five years since the Cancer Alliances were created around diagnostic and treatment pathways. And what we know is that it's, it's fair and right that patients should get a standard of diagnostic treatment that's best best in class and, and best evidence um, wherever they're, they're diagnosed and that that's really about minimising steps using the long, really long um, data we have on things like um, breast cancer, which has essentially been a one stop shop for probably 30 years um, and also think about our innovative workforce models and a huge part of this is learning from each other to make sure that we're really, really using the best um, of our teams. And, and a good example of this is in neurology, the Marsden team have now basically removed um, medical consultants from the pathway before treatment and, and the service from referral all the way to um, telling the patient the bad news, doing the biopsy and actually giving treatment options is run by a nurse led service headed up by a nurse consultant. And these kinds of models we think are really the future um, and, and are really exciting um, for nursing and also allied health professionals. Um, and then the fourth piece, and this was something that we were really strongly fed back on in our um, strategy engagement, was about personalised holistic care. And I think there's some sort of really outcome based wins here around prehab and rehab, which we know impact on patient outcomes irrespective of stage of diagnosis, mental health support and whether that um, supports nice guidelines, 
stratified follow-up and then holistic care. And of course, all of these things need to happen across the cancer continuum, which more and more is not in um, secondary care, but, but increasingly in primary care, um, particularly post-follow-up, uh, uh, post post-treatment. And then wrapping around all of these is our um, cancer inequalities and variation and using innovation spread and adoption. And I'm really proud of um, the work that RM Partners has done on this. Um, so, for instance, fit testing, which is now the standard um, pre-referral pre, uh, test for um, GI cancers, is now was, was trialled by RMP and rolled out very, very quickly nationally by the um, bit, um, to, to help with um, endoscopy backlogs and weights. And that, that starts to help us manage um, the overall workload of two-week weights and the overall sensitivity. And in all of this, these four programmes, there is a huge amount of um, in, uh, work that we need to do with our providers and ICSs to make sure it's consistent with the overall ICS enablers. So what we don't want to get into is doing something that doesn't fit with the wider strategy. And when we think about this, what we can see is that nurses and allied health professionals are absolutely critical um, and that specialists and advanced roles are going to continue to grow over the next five to ten years. Um, we know that in screening we've already got practice nurses, radiographers and breast CNSs and we know that all of those things could be enhanced and, and probably we will see more AI in um, terms of screen reading and things. Um, similarly in pl place in primary care we have a huge diversity of staff now in primary care with physician associates and clinical pharmacists um, as well as um, practice nurses really supporting and giving a different um, practice specialty into to primary care. And of course, those roles can all be adop um, adapted and um, extended over time. And then I think we're all very familiar with the diagnostic and treatment pathway scope of practice and the ability there. But I think there's a huge um, opportunity for specialist services um, as well as clinic CNSs. And particularly really managing the continuity going forward. So um, what we're very keen to use is the HEE a multi-professional framework, which really looks at nurses and AHPs in terms of four core competencies. So, so one is obviously credibility in clinical practice, and over time that will go from core to specialist to advanced. Um, and you know, advanced is is so exciting um, when we think about the opportunities that gives over the um, period of a of a longer um, and longer career as uh, retirement ages keep increasing. Um, facilitated learning, so really making sure that both our, our nurses and AHPs are instrumental to training and teaching others um, and leading by example, but also ensuring that um, they are able to constantly learn and develop. And one of the things we're really keen to ensure is that, particularly in some of the extended roles, it's nurses teaching other nurses rather than the model of a consultant teaching um, sort of uh, the nurse or um, or AHP, because that will mean that we get much better throughput. Leadership, and I think the leadership of um, CNSs is, is, you know, is there every day in terms of the decisions that we're making for patients or that you're making for patients. But I think also the wider leadership in terms of the values of nursing and cancer nursing and thinking about how we can really promote that very deliberately to ensure that patients who are best represented, as we know, by um, by a multidisciplinary team, but nurses are very, very um, used to being advocates for patients is really felt. And then continuing to evidence um, our, our impact in terms of research and development. And I think that I like this, this new um, piece around thinking about core specialist and advanced roles, because, you know, I think that that, that helps promote the fact that we can always go beyond. So um, before uh, everyone's sort of wondering why we're not mentioning any of the challenges, we are. Um, I think that what we've seen increasingly is, is challenges around the scale and scope of services. So, you know, it's, it's, it's high pressure if you're the only person in a system. And what we want to do is make sure that we are working towards having networks and supported um, peer, better peer support to enable the scale and scope of services to be more resilient and also to give greater opportunity. Um, CNSs um, and parity of banding, I think, is a pretty much an issue um, since time at immemorial and, and actually a pretty much an issue for pretty much every work group in the NHS. But I think it's important because what it speaks to is role variation, particularly around workload and role focus. So 
different roles have slightly different emphases and that might be fine because we might have particular populations that need different roles but we need to be able to articulate the difference. One of the things that I think has come out through the literature is not that um, CNSs and nurses don't have impact, but that we haven't done enough to evidence and research that. And I think that um, it's, it's a good challenge to us um, to think about how we can continue to do that. My sort of view is pragmatically, it's always hard to show a negative and we always know it's a complete disaster if we don't have um, our, our senior clinical roles in the system. But I think it's good to think about just how some of the intangible things that maybe we all know implicitly, but isn't, isn't necessarily clear um, when you're looking at bottom lines. And then nurses and leadership roles. And I think then burnout and exhaustion, and particularly over the last couple of years where cancer nurses have been at the absolute backbone of ensuring that patients get safe care and that are prioritised and led through the system. And then finally, access to specialist education. And that's something that I know Nate's very keenly working on with um, the specialist team. So I think you've probably heard enough from me. And what I um, wanted to do was now just open this up to a discussion. I've got to move into um, the, the room with the rest of the um, chairs for t today and the, the steering group. But what I thought might be helpful is to think about moving forward, how we create opportunity for ourselves and each other. Really acknowledging some of the changes that we want to and need to embrace, but also being clear that there are values that we always will want to retain and actually parts of our role that we need to retain. Um, so, so it's how we build on rather than discard. So um, I'm just going to pop off into the next room and then I can take questions and see you all. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm just going to quickly introduce the panel before we get to some questions. Yeah. So my name's Elaine Tomlins. Um, I'm consultant nurse at the Royal Marsden. Uh, you've already met Susan and you've already met Philippa. And then Nate, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Oh, hi, so I'm Nate Holland. I'm the workforce leader at RM Partners. Uh, nice to meet you all today. And Lorna, are you coming on camera? I think I think Lorna might be having some problems. Um, We'll see if we, we'll see if we get locked. She, her camera was working earlier, so hopefully she will, she will come on. Um, thank you again, um, uh, Susan, for um, that great presentation. Um, please feel free to put some questions in the chat. Um, that would be fabulous. Um, I had a couple of thoughts. I missed um, just the last snitching of your talk, Susan, because my screen froze. So forgive me if, if you've answered something that I'm going to ask, but um, um, hopefully. So I'll start with you, Susan, if that's OK. So. I, you mentioned a lot about the um, integrated care systems and things, and um, and I, I just want the question. Um, Nathan had a conversation about earlier in the week when we we're thinking about workforce. What what is our national cancer policy going forward now? Previously, we've had sort of the um, you know the world class um, document, and we had uh, NCAG for chemotherapy. Is, is there a refreshing of the of the documents, or is it is it all directed around the integrated care systems now? So I think I think the overall strategy for the NHS continues to be the long term plan, and the commitments around cancer are very very clear in terms of the seventy five percent of patients getting diagnosed at stage one and two, improved survival and um, reduced inequalities. I think the, the change that's happened through the ICS is, is just being probably more clear about the Alliance mandate, which I think in RMP had happened really as a result of COVID, where um, we were necessitated to change the way we were working in order to support hub working and so on. Okay. Thank you. I'm on two devices now, so I hope um, you didn't get any feedback then. I tried to look at the questions as well at the same time. Um, and perhaps I'll bring you in, Nate, here as well um, around some of the things that Susan said about workforce. And you gave that excellent example of uh, nurse-led service and practitioner-led services, AMP services, um, AHP services. Um, but actually, in terms of succession planning and um, the, the plans going forward, of course, if these key people fall over and break their legs, of course, we don't have a service because we're just not there yet, are we, with this succession planning? I just wondered, Nate, um, if you had some thoughts around uh, what's going on at RM Partners in, in, to bridge that gap. So, uh, thank you, Elaine. And, and you're absolutely right that that has been kind of definitely been identified as a risk. It's that kind of 
how do we enable kind of, um, dare I say, that the pipeline of, of nurses into cancer services? Because, you know, we have to think about actually if we're trying to progress people um, who um, who already are cancer nurse, specialist nurses, how do we kind of then almost backfill them? And, you know, so we I've been working with um, various partners to actually kind of look at different ways that we can kind of encourage people from, let's say, being a student nurse through to coming straight out of being a student nurse into kind of actually, well, then how do we kind of get them on a pathway that brings them into cancer services? And so we've been exploring options like developing apprenticeships that can go in the routes of either diagnosticians or, in, or down the route of as, as a cancer nurse specialist and really trying to understand the very key differences within those two roles and the, the very good opportunities at the role within those roles as well. So that's that's one element of it. And of course, that other element then comes about actually how do you kind of do that, um, I suppose, uh, succession planning in terms of actually right now that we've got all of these um, um, adv adv let's say advanced nurse practitioners or clin clinical nurse specialists in, in cancer services, actually how do we kind of facilitate their continuous learning. So we're looking at different funding models as well. So historically, we've relied very heavily on Health Education England's kind of um, allocation of funds. But actually, we know that that is an agenda that's ever shifting and isn't very sustainable. So we are looking at the apprenticeship funding, which is something that every trust is mandated to pay. So there's, there's some that access to that money. So we're working with a, with a lot of our partners to understand what is that kind of pathway? How do we enable that? But to add further to that, we also want to make sure that we have the educational um, supervision and, and mentoring skills within the workforce, because whilst we want to develop um, these nurses, we want to make sure that the nurses that are going to be teaching or the next generation also have those skills. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what we want to be doing. We also want to make sure that our um, business cases and, and any kind of um, information is robust enough that trusts who kind of have the purse strings can really see that actually this is really such a fantastic opportunity and not only an opportunity, but actually it's it's necessary. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a lot there. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, there's some questions coming through, unfortunately, because we all put in our little code for um, what we want to be called. I can't tell where they're coming from, but somebody said around, you know, what's the focus of the SACT nurses, particularly in terms of when they join the workforce, you know, what sort of opportunities there are for them. And, and I know we've got we've got a, a group together, haven't we, very early days, but um, perhaps Nate, you just might come back to comment on that before I move on to the others. Absolutely, thank you. And so you're absolutely right. What we're doing at the moment is we're, look, we're doing a, a SACT workforce review. And what that means is it's actually having a look at what is the current service and actually is, is that kind of the best way to be delivering it? And if not, what are the kind of opportunities? And I think it'd be really, really helpful if we had your thoughts and your opinions on actually the opportunities that you see within your services now and how we can support you um, as well. And that's learning opportunities. So for example, how what does the SACT um, services of the future look like? You know, does it look like that we're delivering more care close to home? If so, do we need to have more virtual conversations skills and do we need to be doing more of those and actually really thinking about how is how is your role going to change in the future and should it change in the future we really need to ask these questions to make sure that you know you're not burning out essentially because as Susan said right at the beginning of her presentation our cancer population of the, the our population who you know being diagnosed with cancers is is ever increasing so actually that means that your workload is increasing too to kind of support the the, the cure of cancers or you know um long in inevitables in some cases. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers that question too. Yeah, I think we've got some real challenges going forward, particularly, I mean, my focus is sapped, of course, but um, you will have been hit seeing the headlines about Nottingham, um, where they're restricting chemotherapy now because there's no workforce. And that's just a dreadful state to be in, isn't it? So um, we really do need some action now. Um, just moving away from SACT for a moment, um, there's a question on the on the uh, the chat about um, Susan. You mentioned about early early diagnosis is the key to uh, curing cancer and uh, some of the, some of the efforts that are going on around that. Somebody uh, as Amanda in the chat has said, um, "What about self referral to some of these?" Um, diagnostic services. We know sometimes as, as a health professional, you go to your GP and you just say, I just need this, but you have to go through the steps, don't you, to get to it. What about um, the resilience of patients um, you know, uh, with self-referral and self-management? 
What do you think? So I think it's, it's interesting. When I, just before I started, I wanted, I, my, my background was primary care um, and, and I was chief executive of a large provider of organisations um, in primary care. And one of the things I wondered about was for some of the pathways, say for breast, are we really adding value in primary care or is it better just to let the woman access the service? And I think, um, I think there's some things that we need to set up to make sure that those things don't just become flooded because I think what we don't want to do is end up with a situation where um, you know women with cancer and really worrying symptoms are sort of being drowned out by the overall and certainly at the moment we're seeing some of our trust with about 30 percent over baseline two-week weight referrals which for breast is just huge volumes um so so my feeling is that um we definitely need to pursue it, but we need to make sure that we've got all of the right services set up. And, and so again, using the example of breast, we know that there's pretty good evidence now, um, and it's, it's called the Nottingham model around myalgia and pain clinics, which allow women with um, significant breast pain to be properly assessed, and their family history to be reviewed, and if that's high, then appropriately put into either a moderate or high risk clinic um, for family history. But, but actually that reassures the woman they don't need imaging and actually they then leave um, and they don't come back. There's not a huge bounce back. So I think it, while we haven't got sensitivities like that, we definitely know that we'll just be putting more people through to we weight imaging clinics. So, so the priority at the moment is to set up different models, particularly for our high volume clinics that will allow us to, um, to start seeing about that, that in the longer term. Um, interestingly, as part of COVID, one of the other cancer alliances set up a cut helpline for patients that thought they might have cancer and um, interestingly I think it was very reassuring that no cancers were diagnosed so, so there is something about when you you know the best expression I've ever heard about high hindsight is how myopic it is it, it doesn't give you 20-20 vision it gives you a completely distorted view of what happened and it's really obvious when you read the daily mail and the seven times the patient came forward that it was completely obvious it was going to be cancer but it in, in reality, I don't think that's the norm. And I think we probably also need to focus on that bit about the referral interval, getting patients in and being able to explain their symptoms well, dealing with things like unconscious bias and, and really making sure that actually that, that variation stops as well. Thank you. Um, it's interesting um, to hear you talk earlier on about um, genetics and education and um, these tools that we now have, oncotypes and uh, Lynch syndrome, that sort of thing. Um, and I know there's a, there's a really nice learning package on um, on the RM Partners website, but, but perhaps I could come to Philippa and Lorna about this. Welcome, Lorna, to, to camera. Um, the, I, I'm new to London, so I, I haven't been around for a very long time, but, and I have holes in my knowledge around genetics. And I think it is becoming really, really important now for us all to understand uh, the basics of genetics and how genetics drives treatment, uh, particular drives uh, the, uh, the, the lack of need for treatment. But um, I also know that you know the workforce is tight and um, study leave is uh, not quite restricted, but difficult. And I just wondered how uh, perhaps the, you know, the providers, Philippa and Law, are, are managing um, uh, getting access to courses and, and where the courses are perhaps they perhaps you perhaps you know perhaps you don't know and um, maybe Lorna if I go to go to you first. Hi sorry about that earlier um, so access to courses specifically in genetics or yeah. generally yeah. in cancer care so um, we oh perhaps we'll go to you Philippa. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes yeah, so what I was going to say so I not aware of any specific um, genetics courses in total, but what you have seen is, you know, particularly say Lynch syndrome, um, there's been um, a programme of education specific to that. And I think they're really useful and often online is really useful because obviously we're all very busy and it's really helpful having online opportunities that are then also available, not just at one point, but for, a you know, for several months, then people can go back and look at it when it, it does fit into their schedule with patients and every, you know, all the other priorities that people have coming at them. So I think that's the sort of way forward. I mean, face-to-face -face is lovely, and I think it still has a place for networking, for people to meet colleagues across the patch. But this online just, just seems a really good opportunity for people to not have to block off a whole day for an hour-long webinar, for example. So I think that's definitely a, a really useful way forward. And Nate, do you want to come in then? Um, for sure. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, so um, I... I so I can hopefully answer this, and, and, and Philip, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of online um, resources 
for kind of learning about genetics. And Health Education England have actually developed a genomics learning hub now. And so there's a lot of resource on there about how to take a, a family history, about how to kind of um, refer people into genetics. And actually there's some, some soft genetic counselling there as well. So what I can do is at the back of the, off the back of this meeting, I can definitely circulate those resources so that you'll have access to, to that and be able to have that as, as Philip says, at your own kind of opportunities and, and you know, it's, and, and as actually Elaine and, and, and Philippa, you both said there are definitely those challenges with study leave and we don't want you to be continuing to do things in your own time, but actually if you have time and if you discuss it with your manager and they're allow, allowing you to kind of access opportunities, they're definitely there. Um, I have a whole host of different learning opportunities that we could definitely circulate as well. So uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put a little pack together for everybody to look because there's also a question in, in the comment box around um, advanced nurse practitioner roles uh, or opportunities. And I, that's a little bit of a complex uh, a question to answer question um, and hopefully I can give it a, a good good answer. Um, so firstly it's about identifying the need within the trust. So if the trust is saying yes this is where we what we want for the future uh, or actually the immediate future as I think it is, is, is definitely the case then they'll, they'll definitely be able to kind of say right this is what the role is in the future. So then we need to then support you and how you can get that get that and that's exactly what we're looking to do at the moment. So we do get money from Health Education England each year to kind of support a number of people throughout West London to kind of uh, go through the, either the advanced nurse practitioner models or any other kind of um, learning that that might be relevant for the area within cancer services. So there's that access there, but you can only really access it if, you're, if your trust is saying that, yep, there's a role for you in the future. So we also need to make sure that we're working with trusts to um, promote and, and really kind of share our thoughts on this. I mean, on, on the need for kind of advanced nurse practitioners and clinical nurse spe uh, specialists within cancer services. So that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work there to, to hopefully that answers uh, your, your question. And I think to add further to that as well, you, you have also asked, oh, I'm just going to admit, and <laughs> um, so, um, sorry, um, the, the other one is uh, lone work in small, smaller trusts. That's absolutely a challenge at the moment. And that's something that we're reviewing as part of the SACT workforce review. So whilst it is kind of like within that, there may be some good models of learning that we come, come out of that, that we're able to kind of apply to different services services and you know it is about how do we make sure that people are supported by maybe bigger trusts or organizations and um, so that there is that cross curve because one thing we would like people to do who who are lone workers in, in smaller trusts is be able to take annual leave and allow to be sick every now and then you know <laughs> so you know it's something we definitely want to kind of support you with and that's exactly what our role is as well yeah doing my job net by reading the um the questions um i am um, I want to, before I bring Susan in, I just wanted to comment on the AMP um, roles and opportunities and any any job that requires it. It's always been my view, it's a personal view, but I have lobbied for it, that we should have training numbers for these positions in, in a similar way that we train registrars. And by doing that, we have consistency of training. We have a commitment to complete the training and we have... Um, the organisation committing to complete the training and you can get it done in a timely way and of course nursing with a, the workforce that we are you know people are allowed maternity leave they're allowed you know challenges they're allowed to move house all those sort of things but if, if they're able to then take that you know their, their training with them then that's got to benefit the whole organisation and the whole NHS so I, I, I lobby for um, training numbers but um, we'll leave it there and bring Susan in at this point. So just a point back to genetics, I think, is I think I think very soon it's going to need to be part of our core curriculum, actually, for cancer nursing. I think when I did my degree in cancer nursing, it was touched upon. Um, but I think it, it's really a module now, isn't it? Because very soon our patients will know more about it than us. Um, and actually, I think the, the change over the next few years will be about using genetics at sort of large for large scale screening. Um, as well as for sort of treatment decisions. And, and interestingly, I think there's certainly a view that stage of diagnosis over time, like once you've got everybody to 75%, the, the next thing is going to be about the genetics because that's then the thing that's going to impact on cancers, not whether or not you were diagnosed early, but whether or not your genetics are favourable. Thank you. Nate, did you want to come back or is that an, an old hand? Uh, old hand. Um, I, uh, also, uh, the, the question around um, supporting nurses 
um, in isolation. Of course, we hope this webinar program is going to connect people um, because you, you are um, generally CNSs in a site specific cancer or maybe you've got two cancers, you know, you could be generic. They, they are a uh, few more of those at the moment. Um, and, and similarly for AHPs as well, often you're the, you're the lone person in, you know, in your field. Um, so we hope this webinar will uh, allow each other to connect. And we were hoping today to have to introduce you to the, your leadership team within the um, organisations uh, with a video, but we haven't quite managed it because of um, annual leave and things, but we will do that next time just to make sure you know who your leaders are. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw this to, um, to a close now because in the interest of time, we promised we would finish on time. So thank you all to our uh, panel and I'm going to hand um, back to Philippa just to do um, some final thoughts, um, if that's okay. And thank you everybody for attending. Thank you to our panel. Thank you very much um, for, to Susan Sinclair and the rest of the panel um, for today's webinar. I hope you all enjoyed it. Apologies for some of the technical issues, but it's the first one, so I think it's um, unfortunately bound to happen. But thank you again for all your patience with that. Um, so within the comments or the chat, there should be coming a feedback form and also a certificate to show that you've attended this, obviously, for um, revalidation, things like that. So just to keep your eyes open for that. Um, the webinar itself, which as, as you're aware we've recorded, will be available for 30 days via the RM Partners website. And um, the next webinar, which will be next month, October the 12th, 13th, which will have more of a breast cancer focus, um, and will be joined by Dame Kelly, um, Kelly Palmer, who's the National Cancer Director for NHS England. So I hope you can all attend that. And um, thank you very much um, for everyone, and have a good Friday and a great weekend. Thank you.